What's up guys? So today on the show we're going to be doing something that's a bit of a departure from cocktail content and we're going to be doing something that's, if it's not new, it's something that we've definitely been trying to do for a while. It's a big, big subject and so maybe I was a little bit intimidated. So what we're going to do is we're going to be talking about all the major spirits categories. The other thing that I'd like you guys to know before we start is that we're not going super in depth into each category, but I'm definitely going to make sure that you guys know everything that you need to know to really understand the subject. If you are just getting into cocktails, it's really helpful to have an understanding of the spirits you use. It'll be a lot easier to think through flavor profiles while you're creating your own cocktails, or at least just know what to expect when you're ordering drinks at a bar. So as I've said, this video is by no means a deep dive, but I'm gonna really try to give you some history and context and tasting notes if we can. First, it's probably helpful to define what a spirit is. In its simplest terms, a spirit is a fermented drink that's been distilled. So for example, when you make alcohol, you can take any Anything that will ferment and add it to hot water, then introduce yeast, and that yeast will begin to eat the sugar and make alcohol. That first mixture is basically beer if you're using grains, or it's wine if you're using fruits, and that type of fermentation will only produce a drink that is between 15 and 20% alcohol. To make that ferment into a spirit, you've got to distill the mixture by adding heat, hot enough to vaporize the alcohol, but not hot enough to boil the water. The alcohol vapor is much more condensed and higher proof than the original ferment. That vapor is then collected, and you've got your your raw spirit. So since we're talking about raw spirits, let's start with vodka. That'll be the first spirit that we'll be talking about. I think it's safe to say that vodka is still probably the top selling spirit in the world. And when Smirnoff was trying to unseat gin as the clear spirit of choice in America, it was marketed as tasteless and odorless so you could have it at lunch and nobody would be the wiser when you went back to work. That's 1940s America. They ate it up and everyone began drinking it. Both Poland and Russia claim to be the birthplace of vodka and it's thought to have developed in the 9th century. However, the first known distillery was in a Russian town named Kilnovsk, which started making vodka in 1174. With that said, it is made in virtually every grain producing country in the world. According to the definition set forth by the regulation European Commission, vodka is a spirit derived from ethyl alcohol of agricultural origin obtained by the fermentation with with yeast from either potatoes and cereals or other agricultural raw materials. It also states that the minimum bottling strength should be no less than 37.5% ABV or 75 proof, and that only natural flavors can be added. Prior to this law being passed in 2008, the countries of Poland, Russia, Sweden, and Lithuania campaigned really hard to have only spirits made with potatoes or grains be able to be labeled vodka. And as a result of this, a clause was added stating that any vodka made from things other than potatoes or grains must be labeled as such, meaning only those made with potatoes or grains are allowed to be labeled simply vodka, whereas the others must disclose the source on the label. A really good example of this would be like Tito's made with corn. So hopefully this has given you a very good idea of what vodka is, but really to sum it up, vodka can really be seen as sort of the base of all spirits. And it is actually definitely is really the base of the next spirit that we're going to be talking about, which is gin. So the easiest way to understand gin is that it is essentially vodka with the addition of botanical flavoring elements. I always say that vodka is gin with no personality. The rules surrounding what can be called gin are very broad, and so it's a category of spirit which is incredibly diverse. And we're in a distillation boom, so there's a lot to choose from. So gin as we know it today is an English twist off another spirit called Jennifer, which the Dutch were producing since the 16th century. Jennifer was basically a spirit with a malt wine base to which juniper was added to mask its harsh flavor and was typically taken as a medicinal tonic. Fast forward to the late 1600s and due to various laws passed taxing French wine and also several tax breaks of the time that led to distillation booms, there is no doubt that gin came from Geneva. And according to gin expert and founder of the 86 company, Simon Ford, the word gin may very well have come about because the English were too drunk to say Geneva. So they just shortened it to gin, which then over time became gin. The rules for gin are simply that the predominant flavor must be juniper and have a minimum bottling strength of 37.5% ABV or 75 proof. Other than that, anything goes. And because of these rules or lack thereof, gin breaks down into five major categories. London Dry, which is what most people think of when they think of gin, Old Tom, Plymouth, New World, and Navy Strength. 
So let's talk about these styles and how they differ. London Dry Gin originated in England, and it has, a, of course, a very strong juniper presence, but it is jam-packed with citrus elements, giving it a strong, bright flavor. It's also known for not having any artificial sweeteners or any flavoring added whatsoever. Also, the botanical flavors must be imparted into the gin through distillation. So for my money, this is one of the most versatile styles for cocktails. This is what I like to use almost solely. Not, not, not completely, but for the most part, I use London Dry. Old Tom is a gin recipe popular in the 18th century and it is sometimes equated to bathtub gin. It was an underground recipe at the time and some people say that people would have to order it through like holes in the walls of pubs. Kind of like American Moonshine, it was illegal. It's a lot maltier in flavor, so closer to its parent spirit, Jennifer, and also makes use of sweeteners as well as some barrel aging. It has a rich history, which I really don't have time to get into, but we definitely owe you guys an, an, a video on this. Although it's still a rarer style of gin, there are a few companies that make it like Heyman's and possibly more famous famously Ransom, which partnered with cocktail historian David Wondrich to create the most authentic recipe they possibly could. So Plymouth Gin is a style that originated in Plymouth, England, and confusingly can only be made in Plymouth, and there's only one brand that makes this style, which is also called, you guessed it, Plymouth. Plymouth Gin is a lot like its London Dry counterpart, but it's a little bit earthier, it's drier in flavor, on top of really pronounced citrus elements, and it comes off a little bit sweeter. It plays really well in the same cocktails as London Dry style does. It's definitely worth checking out if you guys never have had it, and it comes in just like your regular proof, and then also navy strength. And that leads me to the New World Style Gin. So New World Style refers to any gin made with elements that don't strictly adhere to any of the aforementioned styles. Since gin is so broad in its definition, distilleries are able to make some really wild proprietary blends, adding in all sorts of botanicals not found in the other styles. Many of these distilleries will use spices, barks, herbs, citrus elements, local to their region most of the time, creating some very specific regional gins. And since we're in a distillation boom and micro distilleries are popping up everywhere, it has really broadened the number and styles of gin available. Not to mention that it's made gin a little bit more of a household name these days, which, you know, it was playing uh, red-headed stepchild of vodka for very many years. And the last style that we're going to be talking about is Navy Strength, which should definitely be considered a style. Although the term is used to signify a gin that is over 100 UK proof, which translates to about 114 proof in the rest of the world. So legend has it that British naval vessels would store their rum and their gin next to the gunpowder. They would just have to below decks. And if the spirits weren't of sufficient proof, if any leakage occurred and it soaked into the gunpowder, the gunpowder would no longer spark. So they needed to make sure that all the spirits they kept down there was at least 100 UK proof, so that if any leakage occurred, the gunpowder would still spark. Which really actually kind of like, do you really want like flammable alcohol to be soaking into gunpowder on a ship? All right, guys, that's it for this volume of The Beginner's Guide to Spirits. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. Please comment below and tell me if there's anything that you've loved or anything that we can improve. The idea is to do several more of these episodes and go a little bit more in depth and a little bit more in depth, but the first few are really gonna just be an overview of spirits, just for beginners that just wanna understand the basics. And then maybe later we'll go into a little bit deeper dives into single spirit categories categories. Yeah, something that I've been meaning to do for a long time and really excited about. So I hope you like it and I'll see you guys on another time.